Hey guys, welcome into a special edition of the Guilty as Charged podcast. As always, I am your host. Joining me today for this special uh, edition of the podcast is Mr. Gilbert Manzano of the OC Registrar and Compas on the Beat. Gilbert, thanks for taking the time to join me. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Steven. Nice uh, little introduction, getting my podcast in there. We're kind of merging these podcasts now, Guilty as Charged and Compass on the Beat, so I'm loving it. Yeah, man, it's it's been fun to... Uh, hear about your guys' journey. You know, uh, I wish I could say I listened to every episode, but I always try to catch the previews and the recaps. Um, how has that experience been for you? I know it's been a little different, obviously, getting from, you know, the the writing world into the podcasting world. So how's that been for you guys? Yeah, man, it's, a, it's been an adjustment, and uh, I've come to really respect what you guys do in the podcasting world because it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of preparation, uh, and, and just taking the time to be on camera is also uh, – kind of a, you know, I guess another kind of chore you have because, you know, you got to get the interviews with, with people. You got to, you know, write out your questions. You got to, you know, have a whole process. People don't see the behind the scenes. And I've really learned that, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time. But I've been enjoying it. Uh, as you know, my co-host, Fernando Ramirez, who covers the Chargers for Sports Illustrated, uh, he, has, he has a lot of energy. He brings uh, the good vibes for me. He kind of wakes me up. But at the same time, I'm thinking about, uh, when he's bringing a point on the charge, I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, that's actually a good point. And you kind of you're kind of sharing ideas uh, and research while you're on camera or while you're recording on audio, and people are kind of seeing that in person. So uh, it's been cool. Uh, we've gotten to meet a lot of people, and, and it's kind of cool to have a new skill as well. We're not just writers; we're we're versatile, like Derwin James out here. So we're doing <laughs> a little bit of everything, you know? Yeah, you guys are becoming the the chess pieces of the Chargers beat. So it's been. Like I said, really fun to listen to and, uh, you know, definitely recommend everybody, you know, give them a follow, give them a listen, because it is really such a unique, you know, window of opportunity for us as fans to be able to listen to, you know, everybody that, you know, or somebody rather that is in the facility every single day talking to these players, because we just we just listen to, you know, the Twitter live streams and stuff like that. But you guys get to be there every day and, you know, watch all these players practice for, you know, at least a short amount of time. But. Uh, it really is a cool experience to listen to. Yeah, you know, it's uh, these uh, press conferences are a little. I guess they're 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 a little different because uh, you know, in 2019, you know, you had a lot of players coming in. You had the locker room, and now you're kind of a little distant. You're still in the building though, so right. we're getting close to the regular, you know, pressers of uh, the pre-pandemic uh, NFL days. But it's good to be back in the building to kind of, you know, conduct. I know people are getting mad because. Uh, you can't really hear us as well, <laughs> like on Zoom. Like on Zoom, we're all, we're all on computers on laptops. But now, you know, we got to speak up a little higher to, to get everybody involved on the on the presser. <laughs> yeah, everybody always gets so mad about it. But it, it's better now that you guys are in a room. When you guys were all outside, it was like we had no idea who <laughs> Coach was talking for, about or for what. training camp. Yeah, when you guys were outside at training camp, we had no idea what was going on. Yeah, no, they, they have little mics over here in the, in the facility, so that does help out a lot. Yeah, I'm I'm sitting there trying to listen, like trying to get the injury scoops of certain players, and I'm like, wait, who hurt their shoulder? Who was this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's different. But the good thing about uh, Brandon Staley, he, he's a loud talker and he's uh, very clear, so you probably could, could catch on really quick with him. Yeah, absolutely, and a uh, great segue to to kind of where I want to start with this because um, obviously you covered you covered three years with Anthony Lynn, right? Or was yes, it? Four? I did. Yeah. Well, 2018, 1920. Yeah, three. So, so, so three years, and now the first year of Brandon Staley. Um, everybody right now is talking about how this team is different, and you know, Brandon Staley is bringing a new energy. Um, I don't necessarily want to get into like an Anthony Lynn Brandon Staley comparison, but do you buy the Chargers being different than you know the Chargers of the past? Yeah, you know, with every coaching change, there's going to be a lot of differences and, and things you notice and. And you're right. I don't want to get into the whole, you know, what does Staley does better than Lynn? Because I thought Lynn yeah. did a lot of great things. And, and you could a lot of people on social media want to agree with me, but I, I'm not going to waste my time in trying to argue with a lot of people. Right, right. But in terms of Brandon Staley, you know, he, he seems to be a guy who prides himself of being prepared for every type of situation you could think of. Like in that Monday night game uh, before halftime, you know, throwing the challenge flag on, mm -hmm. on a first down ruling for the Raiders, you, you would think, who cares about that first down? They're backed up inside, you know, they're on 20. There's two minutes to go before halftime. You're up 14 and zero. Why even risk uh, losing a timeout? But it, it kind of just shows you that Staley is all about momentum. And he loves to go into, into the locker room at halftime with momentum. So to get that challenge, it kind of shows you how detailed he is. And then they got the ball back because they punt it. 
And uh, you could you could talk about Gruden not going for it there. Yeah, he's he's pinned back, but it's like a fourth and short. But he didn't go yeah. for it. And then Justin Herbert had probably one of the best drives of the game to execute. Uh, to, I think it was uh, the the wheel route to Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler, yeah. They went twenty one zero, and that was just a perfect near two minute drill for for Herbert. I think it was two forty five on the clock. But overall, those are the type of things you notice with Brandon Staley. Little small details that end up paying dividends in the long run because to go up twenty one to zero. You have all the momentum in the world, and those Raider fans that, so if I say, were very quiet going into halftime. <laughs> How was that experience on Monday? Because I, I know, like ESPN, I don't know if you've heard, but ESPN and, and the pregame broadcasts were making a huge deal because they felt like it was like ninety percent Raiders fans. Um, obviously, I've I've heard a little bit different, but it, you know, it was a pro Raiders crowd. But um, what's been your general experience uh, like these past two or the two home games at SoFi Stadium? Yeah, you know what. Uh, Last year, I kind of took took for granted how many non-fan stories I needed to write about. Like, you kind of get tired <laughs> of it after a while. Like, yeah. when I was here for 2018 and 2019, I wrote a bunch of fan stories about, you know, opposing fans taking over the home the home venue for the Chargers, the Chargers playing on a silent count, stuff like that. And you kind of get over it. You get tired of who cares after a while. Then you go to 2020, and you kind of forget about it. But then the stories start coming back in, uh, you know, 2021, and brand new stadium, a SoFi Stadium. You know, how, do the Chargers have a big fan base now with Justin Herbert? So people are curious. So I get, you know, writing about it. But it was a big deal this week because uh, the Raiders have a lot of, you know, strong ties in Southern California. They played yeah. in Los Angeles. There's a lot of Raider fans. So, you know, I was kind of expecting a heavy Raider crowd. And I don't think it was 90-10. That, that's, you're kind of blowing that out of proportion. It was more maybe 70-30, maybe even 65-35. Uh, there was a lot of powder blue in the stands. You know, it pops out a little more. But... It wasn't, you know, a lopsided thing, but, you know, they, they were out there. I'll give them credit. Raider fans were, were loud, and they, they they always support. It's crazy to me that they're on their second city from L.A. to Oakland to Las Vegas, and they're still diehards. But, you know, I think Charger, Chargers are getting a lot of traction in, in Southern California and Los Angeles to get a fan base out here. And you really saw in the Cowboys game, you know, that also is a strong fan base on the road. And Keenan yeah. Allen said it was 50-50. I thought it was more 60-40. We're all guessing here, but you do sense the strong support here. And and may, maybe it was, you know, a heavy Raider crowd on Monday, but Derwin James said after the game, you know, we heard the Chargers fans that were there. We want to do it for them. You know, it, it cannot – who cares if it was, you know, maybe 100 or 200, but Derwin James was out there fighting for those guys because they care. They want to do it for the, for the people who have been supporting them. And then, uh, you know, Derwin James gave them credit, and people love to hear that kind of – you know, respond. Same thing with Brandon Staley. He, you know, I think for him, it was maybe caught him off guard. They're like, okay, this is actually a real kind of storyline where, you know, you might have to go into a silent count and, and you have to kind of communicate better for yeah. a home game. But after a while, Staley is like, Man, who cares who's out there? We see the powder blue and we're going to do everything we can to win for them. And we're going to be prepared at all costs for whatever outcome is going to be in the stands. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And, you know, I was at the Cowboys game. It felt Pretty close to 50-50, not like all the way, but from my perspective, it did feel pretty close, pretty even. And, you know, it was it was a really fun atmosphere to watch a game, right? Like you had so much energy from both sides and obviously you wish you would have, you know, the full home crowd. But, you know, I think we're really chipping away. I really do. And, you know, as long as the Chargers are able to keep stacking wins and all this excitement about Brandon Staley and Justin Herbert, like it really is to me feeling like we're about to turn a corner. Um, and I really hope that is true. So, well, we're, we're here to uh, talk about the first four games. Obviously, you mentioned the the Raider game. And, you know, something that you mentioned really kind of, you know, stood out to me is that re- this team really makes adjustments, man. Because, you know, we saw in the Kansas City game, they weren't able to get up 21-0. And Monday night, they were able to get up 21-0. So, what have you been seeing on the field in terms of, this the preparation that this coaching staff is making in terms of adjustments you know what i'll start with the with the defense especially particularly the russian defense i felt like the first two weeks was growing pains a new scheme they can't really figure it out they couldn't get comfortable with it and, and brandon Staley was really honest with the players he, he, he was saying the scheme is fine the the structure is okay the formations are fine you got to execute and i kind of like that from the yeah. coach to kind of challenge the players because you know and the thing about Staley, he wasn't coming in here saying, you know, my system works because the Rams were the number one defense a year ago. He, he actually talked to his players to kind of get a feel for how do you want to create this scheme? And so after he got everybody's input, input, he could say, 
and challenge players like, hey, this is what you wanted. This is the input that you wanted. So yeah. let's now keep it real here. And you're not making it work. So the first two weeks, because that week two game was the Cowboys, they got gashed pretty bad by Tony yeah. Pollard and uh, Zeke Elliott. But then in week three, you saw they're getting comfortable. You kind of saw the, the adjustments that the players were making. And having Drew Tranquil come off the bench was big in that, uh, with the Russian defense. And, and it did allow yards in that game. In, in that game, But the game plan was to limit the, the explosive plays downfield, to limit Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey. You want to get your, your plays in the short game. And you want to extend the game on your drives to kind of have more opportunities to create takeaways, we'll take them. And the Chargers got four takeaways because Mahomes had the ball for, for a lengthy amount of time in every drive. But now in week four against the Raider game, you saw that they kind of got over the growing pains. They kind of figured out the scheme. They're in the right places. They're executing. And it kind of came together because that, that Raider offense was red hot. They were number one yeah. total offense going into the game. And you shut them down for zero yards in the first quarter, 51 yards in, at, at halftime, one first down at halftime. Uh, 48 yards rushing overall in the game. Like that was a good team. You just shut down. So that was kind of the coming out party for Brandon Staley's defense. And I started remembering that a year ago, the Rams kind of took a while as well. Like, you know, they were mm -hmm. in the pandemic. They didn't really know Brandon Staley and they became number one by the end of the year. So I think that's where you're seeing the adjustments. Maybe it's not a big adjustment in terms of X's and O's, but uh, getting comfortable, kind of knowing your role and, and kind of growing together. That was really big for this uh, Chargers defense, and, and and you have a defense clicking with Justin Herbert, you know, doing his thing, and they've improved the red zone offense as well. They had their own kind of hiccups with Joe Lombardi. They're kind of clicking now, and I think the the word, key word was from the the Monday night game. They're being a complete team right now. Yeah, I really believe that as well. And you know, you look at you know the the recipe for success on offense, if you will, the first three weeks, it was Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, right? And then in Monday night against the Raiders, they had 47 total yards, and you still win by two touchdowns. Yeah, no, th that shows the depth of this offense, all the playmakers you have. And I'm actually writing about the tight ends today that uh, Jared Cook, Steven Anderson, and uh, Donald Parham Jr. were big in that Monday night game because, like you mentioned, Mike Williams and Keon were contained. And how frustrating must that be for John, John Gruden <laughs> and Gus Bradley yeah. that you shut down the two best wide receivers on the team, maybe the best well, it sounds like they are the best tandem in the NFL, Keenan right. and Mike. And then you still have Jared Cook stepping up. You have Austin Eckler having a massive game. And it is, it's probably really deflating for opposing defenses that you have to kind of, you know, figure out, was that a tight end coming out of the fullback position to get a 30 or 40-yard <laughs> reception? Like, these guys are making plays after plays, and it kind of just shows every week. Like, now that they have to figure out the number two running back situation behind Eckler. But once yeah. they get that going, it's going to be a pretty complete offense. Well, and that's the other thing too. Like you know, they're they're still trying to figure out a lot of the depth pieces around them, and it, it feels like every single week they add like a new wrinkle with things. You know, this uh, Brian Baldinger pointed this out. I didn't, I didn't catch this live. You know, but the offset line of scrimmage with Jared Cook lining up at tackle and then leaking out and catching you know that wheel route. So it really feels like to me that Joe Lombardi and this staff are really adding new things, adding new wrinkles to this offense every single week. Are you kind of seeing the same thing? Yeah, and, and that's where you kind of saw a lot of penalties early on because there are a lot of groupings, there are a lot of motion, there's a lot going on. It's a very complicated scheme. That it's kind of like what Brandon Staley does. They want to have disguises and kind of throw you off. So, uh, you know, when you have those two guys going at it in the, in the meeting room saying, this is what I would do if I was in that situation, that's what I would do. So it's kind of a lot of motion and groupings and you got to figure out. And, and I think the one thing you want to notice you know, with, with Justin Herbert, when he starts kind of playing faster, like he's playing really, really, really great right now. Yeah. But when he's getting in a groove of the, the, the formations and the motions and all that, it's going to be a, a, a bigger problem. Like these are little small things you can't that you don't really see in everyday football. But it, it, when he starts playing faster and, and memorizing his formations and who's going in the right spot and looking out for the motion, like you could tell in that Monday night game, Herbert was a little slower because he wanted everybody to be set on the on the motions. Like, OK, let's not mm. get penalized here. Let's keep it a little slow here and not attack as fast. Once he gets that down and he knows where everybody's going, it's going to be a bigger problem for the defense as well. Yeah, I mean, this offense can just cause so many problems. Um, I want to talk now about, I mean, you guys are at a training, training camp practice every single day. You know, we're talking about all your reports and stuff like that. So, I, again, you guys have just such a unique window of opportunity into seeing this team. Who's been a player that has – kind of surprised you with how well they're playing at this point surprise huh 
man, that's actually he put me on the spot. You know, I'll keep I'll keep I'll keep showing maybe love. It's not really a big contribution contribution, but I I think we should mention Steven Anderson a little more. Like this guy's playing fullback, tight end, helping out on special teams. Uh, you know, just doing the little things. And 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 Brandon Staley went out of his way to give him a shout out because we haven't been asking about Steven Anderson yet. Uh, so he is a glue guy. So like you mentioned, you know, the the depth and guys who are stepping up because you do know you have a lot of star players. Like this roster has been top yeah. heavy for a good years. Like. Joy Bosa, Derwin James, but when injuries happen, what do you do? And you know, now that I'm thinking about it while I'm talking here, guys like Christian Covington have step, stepped up and, and, and been surprising. You know, Drew Tranquil, who was supposed to be a starter, he had to kind of you know come through the you know from the sideline to kind of help out because Kenneth Murray was you know struggling. But, but when Drew came out, he was helping out as well. Uh, Nazir Adderley, we we've been expecting big things for that guy yes. uh, since 2019, yeah. second round pick. And he's finally putting it together. Like these last two games, I've, he's been flying around, you know, making plays with Derwin James right next to him. So, and even Jerry Tillery, like that 20, like we were actually on the verge of writing off that 2019 draft class like yeah, two we weeks were. ago. And then Drew Tracko comes out and, and helps out. Nas is stepping up, Jerry Tillery. So, 2019 draft class, they deserve a lot of credit for the last two games. Yeah, that's a great call, you know, with that draft class, because I know, especially during training camp, and it was like, oh, Drew's not really starting. We haven't heard much about Jerry Tillery. People were upset about that draft class. So uh, it, it's been great to see, you know, them flip the other way. And, and you know, Adderley in particular is is someone to me that has been really standing out right now. Yeah, and, and I, I think it, it shows you how much having Derwin James on the field helps helps him out. Yeah, like just in terms of communication, and it sounds like now Nas is trying to take, call some of the plays as well. Like he's a one step ahead of Derwin, <laughs> I hear, and in terms of communication. But you know, with him, it was just kind of like having a good feel and instincts because he plays so fast, kind of like Kenneth Murray. Maybe Kenneth Murray will figure that out in, in a year, or maybe hopefully this year when he comes back from the ankle injury. But it, it's uh, maybe he was doubting his instincts or. He was playing too fast, and now you know he's flying all over the field. And and because I think Staley utilizes him in such a good way for for his skills, he's not just on, on the back like a center field waiting for an interception, uh, and having him guess when, where the ball's going. Now he's kind of playing closer to the line of scrimmage every now and then because Derwin's shifting so much. And you know, you sometimes you have a Loki playing in, in the back end, and you have Nas yeah. kind of moving up a little closer. So I think Nas is enjoying the extra role. Uh, as as a safety, but it probably took him a couple of games as well to kind of figure it out because it's not a it's not an easy scheme to figure out. And a lot of people were saying in in, in, in the offseason during the free agency, why aren't they going for John Johnson or signing a safety? Well, yeah. because people wanted to give uh, Nazir Ali a chance to play, and he's proving it right now. Yeah, I was uh, definitely guilty of, of that, as uh, you might recall from our LEFB <laughs> roundtable back then. Yeah. Uh, but that was you know it's all good. It's all good fun. You you live and you learn from those kind of things. Um, what's an area that you feel like, obviously, you know, the, the Chargers have some two very tough games, uh, before the bye week and the Cleveland Browns and the Baltimore Ravens. What's an area that you think the Chargers need to improve upon over these next two weeks before the bye week? That's a good question. Cause they've been playing pretty well the last, last two weeks. And yeah, and a lot of people like to harp on the, on the Russian defense. I don't think it, it was that big of a problem because I think Staley goes, goes off a game plan. But I'll go off uh, Russian defense because you're going to face Nick Chubb and Kareem, Kareem Hunt uh, this Sunday. And then the following week, you're going to face Lamar Jackson. And I know that they're banged up at running back. But when we have Lamar Jackson, you're going to have a good rushing attack. So we're going to see is this a poor Russian defense or is it just based on, on game plan. Because if they're scheming for Bradley Chubb and uh, – sorry, uh, uh, Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. So many Chubbs. Yeah, a lot of Chubbs out there for, for <laughs> Cleveland. If you're scheming for those guys then you would think that you have a better outcome. Uh, so, you know, I want to see, you know, how they, they will play because they won't have Justin Jones, and he's a big guy when it comes yeah. to run, run stopping. And they held their ground against the Raiders, but I want to see them against the number one rushing attack, Cleveland, and see what they do there because that's kind of a, a concerning part. And I feel like on, on, on offense, you know, they've kind of weathered the storm, not, no pun intended, on Storm Norton. And uh, <laughs> being a right nice. tackle, they've, they've helped them out. <laughs> Uh, you know, with the extra blocking, the, the chipping, they have tight ends helping out because guys like Parham are, have, have excelled as blockers as well. Uh, mm. Steven Addison playing also there. But uh, they've got to figure it out. Maybe if I'm nitpicking for the offense, you want to see that uh, that three wide receiver, number three wide receiver step up. I know it's either Jalen and what happened to Josh Palmer as well. He hasn't really played much. Uh, 
you yeah. know, guys like KJ Hill. But when you have Jared Cook, Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, and Mike Williams, that might be okay. But you would like to see one of those uh, other wide receivers step up as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think those are both are good calls. And I think, you know, Jalen Guyton took a lot of crap for, you know, not catching that touchdown in Kansas City. Yeah. I, I don't think it was that bad of a drop. I think that was a pretty good play by Dan Sorensen. But um, I, I do agree. I think that, you know, the Chargers, in order to reach, reach their peak on offense, they need one of those guys to really step up and uh, separate themselves. Yeah, no, no, definitely. And, and, and maybe eventually they'll figure it out. But like I mentioned, they have three tight ends of contributing. And they have, you know, the running back also to play as a wide receiver as well. So uh, maybe they'll be okay. But, you know, maybe they'll give Josh Palmer maybe some more snaps. You know, maybe he's not kind of showing enough in practice, but eventually they'll get trust in Josh Palmer because he was a stud. In training camp, he was making plays. Yeah. I know, Steven, you're out there watching Josh Palmer, so it's a little surprising he's not out there a little more uh, creating plays, but I think over time he'll be all right. Yeah, uh, I, I agree there. And, you know, they, they've done such a good job with these rookies so far. Obviously, Rashawn Slater being as good as he is it, is, you know, a testament to him, but, you know, the coaches are, are still having to game plan around him and stuff like that. So, um, Gilbert, we get you out of here on this. I think one of the more interesting things – of the season is obviously the the two wins in the division after you know we're two years away from them being zero and six in the division and now mm -hmm. justin herbert and brandon Staley have kind of flipped that so how has the last two weeks specifically kind of changed your outlook for the chargers on the season yeah no i'm glad you mentioned that i think that's that's big a big confidence booster because you, you mentioned they went winless in the afc west in 2019 well, yeah. that streak continued in 2020. They lost nine games in a row in the division. It was a long streak we were talking about. And Jeez. then <laughs> it, was, it, was, it felt like forever. Trust it me. I, I, was, I kept writing about it. But, it, hey, I'm, I'm going to give at the end a shout-out. You know, people wanted people to wanted the Chargers to tank. But winning some of those games at the end of the year in 2020, you know, beating the Raiders in Las Vegas, maybe that, that meaningless game in KC, I don't know if it did something for them, but that was another victory in the AFC West. So getting that momentum – might have helped, you know, somewhat to, for 2021. I don't know how big of a role it did, but having that winning feeling, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about it. They probably have like a five or four game winning streak in the division. So overall for the Chargers confidence, you know, is up there. But to beat the Chiefs at Arrowhead Stadium, the five-time defending AFC West champions at their house and kind of knock them in the, in, in the mouth, you know, that's a big confidence booster. And then you do that to the Raiders who are, who, like I was mentioning, they're, they're really red hot at the moment. They have studs all over the field. Like, like the Raiders kind of remind me of the Chiefs, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but they have Darren Waller, uh, Henry Ruggs, or uh, Hunter Renfro. And they, you go and shut that, that team down to how many little yards they had, I think about 200 and, and something. Uh, that's big for your confidence now. You, you know. But I, I like what Derwin James said after the KC game. Like, they didn't make any statement. Like you, get, you still have to play the Chiefs on Thursday Night Football when they come to SoFi in Week 15, I think. So overall – to be possibly the two best teams in the AFC West at this point is a big confidence booster. And then you would think this division is going to be pretty close, neck and neck, come December. And now you have some of those tiebreakers in your back pocket because you've beaten the teams early on in uh, September, October. Yeah, big big, big uh, tiebreaker weekend this weekend as well against the Browns. Next weekend with the, with the Ravens. You never know what kind of stuff pops up at the end of the year. Uh, as we all remember from the 2017 season, uh, when they miss the playoffs because of a tiebreaker yeah. against the Bills. So uh, you never know what tiebreakers pop up. And, uh, Gilbert, this has been awesome, man. Can't, think, can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, what do you have coming up on the OC Register and Combas on the Beat that uh, we can be looking, uh, keeping an eye out for? Yeah, no, Stephen, I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to plug my stories. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, for, for this week, on top of my head, I'm going give to give some love to the tight ends, like I've been mentioning throughout this whole show with you. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to analyze the Russian defense as well because you're playing Chubb and, and Kareem Hunt. Uh, and maybe do a, a nice story on the, the Browns defense because this might be the toughest defense that Herbert has faced in all year yeah. because, you know, the Chiefs are okay, the Raiders are okay, Cowboys have gotten better, and Washington is not who we thought they were going to be. Like this Browns defense is legit, so it's going to be a true challenge for Herbert. So I'm going to really look at that and kind of enjoy that matchup. And uh, on the podcast, the uh, you know, we, we've been recording three times a week because football season, I'm sure you have a lot of podcasts this time of year as well, Stephen, yeah. guilty as charged. But, you know, we try to have an, uh, a beat writer from the opposing team once a week. We drop that, those podcasts on Thursdays. You know, we you know we actually have uh, Joe Reedy, Uncle Joe. He's not an opposing beat writer, but he knows Cleveland really well because he grew up in Cleveland. So we decided yeah. to kind of bring him on. So 
Uh, and then Wednesdays, we have our regular show. We kind of just have fun with it, have random stories about our road trips and, and movie reviews. We get really random. And then Sunday, we have uh, the game recaps at night or possibly Monday morning when you're when you're playing like these late games on Monday Night Football. You, you tend to yeah. wait because nobody's awake at 1 o'clock. I heard on uh, on the Chargers podcast with uh, Chris and Haley that Fernando didn't get home until like, I think he said like 3.30 or 4 after the game on Monday, which is yeah, crazy. He, like he, I, I make him record with me and we're there till like <laughs> 1 in the morning. And then he has to go drive to San Diego, which is a, yeah. an, another 90 minutes or two hours to get home, you know. So uh, 3 o'clock sounds right for him. <laughs> crazy, man. But uh, yeah, really appreciate your time, Gilbert. Chargers fans, make sure and give him a follow. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see his handle right there at gmonzano24. Gilbert, thanks for taking the time to join us, man. No problem, Steve. Keep doing your thing, man. I appreciate it. Same to you.